Okay. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year to all. I am Dr. Aris Obando. I am the Assistant Dean for Research and Advanced Studies of the Gokong Way College of Engineering of De La Salle Univer University. I would be your host for this morning, and together with me is Dr. Maria Victoria Sumagang, or Ms. Dr. Ria, from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Together with us, we have Professor Kathleen Aviso, the Dean of the Gokong Way College of Engineering of De La Salle University. And uh, what a way to start our new year with a La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series entitled Sustainability and the City in a World of Extremities and Uncertainties. And before we officially start our session, uh, we would have a brief prayer. Thank you very much, Ria. Uh, at this point, may I acknowledge the presence of Chancellor Emeritus Professor Carmelita Takebenko, who is also part of the founding officers of this La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series. Morning, ma'am. And to give us an introduction of the Sustainability Lecture Series, let us all welcome Professor Raymond Tan, Vice President for Research 
and innovation of De La Salle University. Good day, everybody. I'm Professor Raymond Tan. I'm the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University in Manila, Philippines. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of the 2024 Sustainability Lecture Series. De La Salle University is a member of a network of La Salian higher education institutions known as IALU. IALU has member institutions in five different continents, the Americas, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and Eastern Asia. De La Salle University is a private comprehensive Catholic university initially founded as De La Salle College in 1911. We are now one year removed from our golden jubilee as a university and have seen extensive growth in research productivity over the past 50 years. We are ranked first among Philippine institutions in terms of research output in this decade to date. We are the most heavily funded private institution in the country and have seen a sevenfold increase in research output over the past uh, 10 years. As a result, we are ranked by the Times Higher Education World University rankings of research intensive institutions and are also top ranked in the following subject areas. Physical sciences, social sciences, engineering, computer science, business and economics, education, and arts and humanities. The sustainability lecture series is inspired by two documents that were published in 2015. Number one, intended for the Catholic world was Pope Francis's Laudato Si encyclical. Number two were the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals intended for the secular world. But what is interesting to note is that these two documents have a strong intersection in seeking sustainable development for the entire planet. And these provide the basis for the series of lectures that we've held since 2021. The sustainability lecture series is organized by a core group, initially consisting of Professor Dr. Kathleen Aviso, the current Dean of the Gokongwe College of Engineering, Dr. Carmelita Kebenko, the former president and current Chancellor Emeritus of De La Salle University, Professor Dr. Alvin Colaba, the Director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, which is the organizational host of this lecture series. And we were joined last year with the support of Professor Dr. Aristotel Obando, current Assistant Dean for Research, and former PhD student, Dr. Maria Victoria Migo Sumaga, and of course, yours truly. Since January 2021, we've dealt with diverse topics in sustainable development, holding lectures online on various topics at the last uh, Wednesday, on the last Wednesday of each month. The lectures have been recorded for the most part and are available in a dedicated YouTube channel. The lectures have been viewed thousands of times by different viewers uh, asynchronously in addition to the live audience that we normally have. And of course, the resource persons are drawn from the global IALU network and we've had speakers from uh, different continents talking about global and local concerns. As we begin a new year, we look at what lies ahead. And first and foremost, we've decided to partner with the newly formed University Sustainability Office at DLSU which will provide logistical support when we look at new issues, when we consider new formats, including hybrid lectures with a live audience inside the university. So these are what are in store for us in the coming year. Thank you and good day. Good day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Tan, for the introduction of the LaSalle Sustainability Lecture Series. And it's, it's good to see that uh, we have a good number of participants to start off this lecture series for 2024. And without further ado, allow me to introduce our speaker for today. 
Our speaker for today is Professor Greg Foliente. He is a 2023-24 Balik Scientist uh, Program Awardee and a distinguished visiting professor at De La Salle University, who is hosted by the Advanced Research Institute on Informatics, Computing, and Networking, or in short, ADRIC, in collaboration with the Enrique Razon Logistics Institute. He is currently a professor of in infrastructure and urban systems in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology at the University of Melbourne and president and board chair for nonprofit International Institute for a Sustainable Built Environment. A scholar of global standing, he is a recipient of the prestigious James Cross Medal from the American Society of Civil Engineers, amongst other awards enlisted in Stanford University's world ranking of top 2% scientists based on his published work in Scopus and in the fields of civil engineering and building and construction. He is in the top 1% amongst researchers worldwide. Professor Gregg has previously worked at the University of California in Berkeley and the Australian National Science Agency, the CICERO, and has been a visiting professor in leading universities in Europe and in Asia. He received his PhD and two Masters of Science degrees in Virginia Tech in the U.S. and executive leadership and management training at the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the MIT Sloan Executive Education. Let us all welcome Professor Greg Foliente. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and um, give this lecture. Let me share my slides. Uh, I will talk today about uh, sustainability and the city. And a lot of these things may be familiar uh, to you, but I'd like to be able to um, build a complete narrative. Um, so bear with me. Uh, some of the concepts I'll have to cover, some of the basics, just to be able to move into some uh, new, new grounds and interesting um, perspectives about sustainability. So. Um, you agree or disagree that uh, sustainability will be lost or won in our cities? Well, uh, sometime in 2008, a group of scholars uh, put together an article that was published in Science, where um, essentially they said they agreed. That urban areas are hotspots that drive environmental change at multiple scales. Cities themselves present both the problems and solutions to sustainability challenges of an increasingly urbanized world, they wrote. So we cities are both the problems and the solutions. So sustainability will be lost or won in our cities. In um, a rough calculation of the ecological footprint of Sydney, and for those of you not familiar with the ecological footprint, it's the, uh, the land area required to be able to grow uh, and support um, human life and um, absorb the waste uh, per capita. And uh, the ecological footprint of Sydney, uh, the largest city in Australia, is equal approximately to 150 times of the actual metropolitan land area, which you can see on the right is the metropolitan Sydney, which is one part of the New South Wales. And if you look at the size of the footprint, it's bigger than the state. It's about 2.3 times the land, the land area of the state, which because of the consumption, intense consumption in the city, uh, it affects the value chain and supply chain of any products that are consumed in the city. And so it affects the hinterlands and the regions and other parts of the world. So in fact, when the, my colleagues at the CSRO uh, develop a scenario future that is um, 
economically, socially, and environmentally uh, ideal in uh, 2060, for 2060 in the future, uh, they identified um, some of the grand challenges in terms of the shifts that need to happen in, this, in the country. Uh, first is a shift in industry, and you can see a shift in urban, in cities, and a shift in energy, which are heavily related to supplying the energy requirements of the city, and a shift in the land, uh, how we use and and um, and uh, and manage our land, which is also related to city, and of course culture. So five shifts to happen for a sustainable future in uh, Australia: industry shift, urban shift, energy shift, land shift, and culture shift. It's all about context of people, place, and location. And this is uh, most um, strongest and most uh, intense in cities because of the intensity of population. And I've uh, uh, run and organized a number of um, international conferences in, in, on this topic uh, that scales from buildings to um, cities to regions. Uh, and the one in the middle is the one we've run about 10 years ago. Um, same title as this presentation, where we map the research landscape uh, and gaps required for uh, sustainable cities. So today will be a fast um, overview of some of the issues in three parts. Uh, sustainability and resilience challenge. I'll talk about the approach that I, uh, I use and encourage others to use, especially my PhD students and collaborators, and how we might uh, address them. So first, um, true or false. Our cities and urban systems cannot be sustainable without being resilient to chronic stresses and extreme events. So um, what do you think? Well, uh, we uh, talk about ecological footprint and um, we say that if um, everyone in the world live like Australians, uh, we would need four planets um, to support that lifestyle. Uh, there are estimates that if you look like to live like Americans, you need seven planets. Unfortunately, we only have one planet and we are ready uh, and, and always should. Second thing is we are in a climate crisis and also planetary boundaries crisis, since uh, uh, six of the nine planetary boundary limits uh, have already been uh, reached, according to the latest research. And then, of course, we have problems of extreme climates and associated hazards and risks uh, that we are most familiar, especially in the Philippines. So the requirement towards a sustainable urban future and, um, and the societal future is that we have to be resilient as we know very well in the Philippines and we need to be sustainable. And what's the relationship between the two? So um, if we map uh, this conceptually over time, uh, we are interested in the future, present to the future uh, and the current state, let's say is at the bottom and the desired state, let's say is the fulfillment in full of the whole uh, sustainability, uh, develop, sustainable development goals as expressed through the SDGs of the UN. So let's say that's the, the goal. Of course, we can be unsuccessful, which is path one, and we can try to reach it, but uh, run out of time and be unsuccessful. Um, it, it may have taken too much time. Um, what we really need is a faster uh, transition towards sustainability. But you can see uh, we, there are uh, disturbances uh, that happen on that path. And so that's why we need to be resilient and to, um, uh, we need uh, a multiple a series of tipping points that accelerate this kind of transition. So we need this uh, tipping point and also resilience uh, towards sustainability. So when we talk about resilience, especially in practice, we talk about um, uh, narrow, narrower or short term periods, um, the loss of electricity, you'd like them back within an hour, the loss, the loss of a mobile phone signal, you'd like them to be back in a few seconds, uh, for example, and uh, the loss of the use of a road or bridge, uh, maybe in a few days, for example. Um, so while sustainability, of course, is generational. And so um, it's about the whole generation. And the idea, of course, is that um, uh, sustainability over long term is uh, dependent on our resilience because we may uh, have stepped forward towards uh, sustainable development goals. But as we know very well in the Philippines, one event and you're set back by one or two steps back. And so if you're not resilient, you're always behind and you never really move forward. And so um, uh, the first principles about this concept is we never really know uh, when to achieve it 
we just try. Uh, the concept of sustainability is that um, homoeostasis balanced environment in which the exploitation of resources and the direction of investment and the orientation of te technological development and institutional change are all in harmony uh, to meet the needs of um, society now and to the future. It is a concept. And we, um, in terms of organizing principle of sustainability, uh, we call, uh, we talk about sustainable development because we have to uh, do things uh, with the natural world and uh, part of a so-called concept of development. And some others think that is, is, this is a paradoxical concept that uh, development is inherently unsustainable. But to make it practical for us um, and actionable, uh, we break them down into a set of goals and performance uh, indicators, measures, and targets. And that's what, uh, for example, uh, because that's the only way uh, we can do something about them is when we break it down. And that's what the SDGs are an example of at the level of uh, our planet and uh, nations. So it is um, that kind of uh, framework uh, that try to um, capture the essence of what sustainability means. We have other um, frameworks that are uh, presented at the level of engineering uh, design and urban design, for example, and different uh, associations, organizations uh, have uh, different methodologies for assessing them uh, broken down at that level. And so this is where we practice most of, most of us, um, our trade and our professions. Um, you're all familiar with the triple bottom line basis of economic, social, environmental. And um, uh, just to mention that um, when you uh, have uh, explicitly uh, valued them in equal parts, uh, that, that is the triptych approach. But sustainability is really just like coffee. Uh, apart from water, uh, the three other ingredients that, are, um, that you put together uh, include, of course, coffee, uh, milk, and sugar. And so you can think of them as the triple bottom line. And so then uh, subjectivity comes in because some people like strong coffee and some people like weak coffee. And so it's the same thing in sustainability. So um, the economic uh, prioritization of some people are termed by others as weak sustainability because it downplays the environment. While the people who uh, uh, favor um, environmental first uh, is called strong sustainability. So subjectivity comes in in the value uh, decision-making. The other thing, of course, that comes in, uh, which adds to the triple bottom line, is the method of governance uh, or the system of governance. Uh, and this is super important, uh, in fact, for everything, because this is, in fact, what uh, drives uh, decision-making and monitoring and uh, institutional support uh, towards the goals of sustainability. And so this overlays whatever approach and thinking you have, whether you are a triptych or strong or weak sustainability, which is then translated now in corporate speak as ESG, as most of you have uh, seen or read much about in uh, business news and reports, for example. Uh, in ESG, of course, they, um, they don't, they're not explicit about economy and financials because that is uh, fundamental to business. And so therefore in governance of corporations, and reporting of their performance, they talk about ESG systems. And so uh, in terms of uh, things that we design and, and, and manufacture and uh, humanly produced, uh, we then need to talk about, in addition to the triple bottom line and the governance, uh, the value and the performance uh, of the things that we build, in this case, the physical assets, uh, whether they are the mobile phone you're holding, the computer you're using, or the roads and houses where we live and, and live our lives, for example. And so for engineering um, um, systems, I talk about um, beyond triple bottom line. Uh, we already talked about four, uh, including governance. And in this case, uh, the bottom lines are really uh, decision criteria uh, that you use uh, to make final decisions. In which case, uh, when you are dealing with the delivery or management uh, or production or design of uh, physical assets, then we talk about four, five, six, seven bottom line. And thus I call N bottom line. So depending on the importance of the criteria in development. So in terms of uh, the built asset, uh, for example, in buildings, um, 
we, you can uh, go down to the level of materials, of course, uh, from plastics to concrete to timber and steel and other um, bio uh, materials. Uh, and of course, uh, you can build them up into whole buildings or cities and nations and the world, uh, which is um, the, the concept in materials flows, stacks and flows um, analysis, for example. And of course, you have the performance dimension. And in the past, we, the engineers have only focused on physical and functional. And of course, now we'd like to add the triple bottom line. And so at a minimum, if you're uh, manufacturing products, uh, or designing products, you're talking about four bottom line over the life cycle uh, in the third dimension uh, from planning to operation to the end of life decision. Uh, that is now very important in the concept, for example, of circular uh, economy and, uh, and, and life cycle thinking. So when, as I said, in the bottom line, if you like to um, uh, elevate uh, sub elements within the four bottom line as very important in the final decision, uh, you elevate them up to become four, five, six, seven, or eight bottom lines. Um, for example, uh, practical examples in, in the world, uh, for example, is the German Sustainable Building Certificate, the GNB, and the Federal Building Certificate, BNB, in Germany, uh, which has this um, five uh, bottom line uh, of ecological quality, economic quality, social quality, technical, and quality of the process. The quality of the location is uh, rated outside of that, but um, it would be five bottom line or six bottom line. Um, I introduced this concept and demonstrated it in an old uh, conference paper that never published in a journal. Uh, but um, along with my uh, colleagues at the CSRO at the time where I used to work, and we applied it in terms of a decision, for example, about supplying uh, an, an urban, developing an urban water system in a, in a, town in New Zealand, uh, where we um, where I discussed and demonstrated the use of this end bottom line in practice, in practical projects. Um, an example of uh, conceptualizing it in a future city uh, urban redevelopment program, one of the largest in Australia, uh, is this one that I developed uh, for that program, which is, of course, six bottom line, uh, adding in, uh, in addition, splitting social and human at the scale of uh, individual to society, but also adding information capital and the importance of data and information. How you set targets within these bottom lines and their sub-elements, uh, we need to take into account uh, a global picture and a local uh, requirement. From a global picture, we need to think of planetary boundaries outside uh, in this circle, which has become to be known as donut economics. And the idea is that we shouldn't um, uh, pass, get past the threshold of these planetary boundaries because instability can happen and many things that are interdependent can start um, cascading down uh, to um, uh, and affect our living. Uh, many Hollywood movies have, of course, um, done a lot of um, movies and stories that talk about uh, uh, humanity's collapse or Earth's collapse. And um, that's the top ecological ceiling. And there's a core that is empty, which is then the social foundation, uh, which is to meet the needs of humans and um, both at the individual uh, and social groups, but also society as a whole regarding sanitation, regarding shelter provision and so on and education as an example. So the idea is that the safe operating space for humanity is the, 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 the in this uh, bounded by the ecological ceiling and the social foundation, which looks like a donut. And this has been um, operationalized in many uh, industries and in cities in particular, but also in other sectors uh, by many people and their tools that you can use. So these are the considerations in uh, targeting a sustainable future uh, that scales from global to the things that we face on a daily basis. But resilience is a necessary requirement for sustainability as um, uh, I've established. Uh, you're familiar what, with what it means, but let me just clarify again a few things. Uh, there's a word called robustness that is uh, often uh, misunderstood to be equivalent to resilience. In engineering and risk, uh, ro robustness uh, means that if uh, I have a system, uh, let's say a road system that includes a bridge and several other things, and in a normal performance, it's 100%. Uh, an event happens like a typhoon or a flood in the Philippines, um, and uh, and uh, if it's designed properly, 
as robust, then it means that it's not um, going to be affected. It's um, designed sufficiently, adequately for that event. But as we know, uh, there are always uh, events that are higher than the design uh, event, uh, including the Typhoon Yolanda, for example, uh, Storm Bank Foot, uh, for example, that happened in Asia Pacific, in particular in the Philippines, and it breaks that system. So there's a yield. Uh, and then the ability of the system to bounce back. So then I, I cheat in, um, in def defining resilience in um, one word uh, by combining three, uh, bounce back ability is whether uh, that system bounce not uh, the path B or ba bounce back in B, bounce less or bounce plus. And of course, what we'd like to be able to do, uh, as I said, is uh, to be able to uh, march towards the sustainable development goals despite these kinds of setbacks. And so you want to bounce plus. And sometimes you don't just want to bounce back to the old system because the old system isn't good enough, as an example. And uh, this is more real with uh, um, uh, the global risk landscape, which is updated by the World Economic Forum every year and was released in January uh, this year, a few weeks ago, um, uh, show uh, the interdependencies, the, the diversity and uh, the interdependencies of uh, global risks. Every year, uh, these priorities change. And um, of course, the natural hazards and climate Events are big, but now you can also see the purple ones that are related to misinformation and cyber security and so on. The problem, of course, is that they don't come uh, in the individually. And so sometimes you have a recession and uh, you get a pandemic, you get climate change on top. And so you now uh, also war and other uh, human catastrophes and you have concurrent risks. Um, and we are familiar in the Philippines for you know, about the disaster management cycle, uh, where uh, mapped on the right is the resilience uh, state space diagram that I introduced to you earlier. Uh, diagram on the left is the cycle of disaster management. And they are related in that phase one of it is prevention and mitigation that we do a lot in the Philippines. And then phase two is the preparedness when we are near um, an event and um, we like uh, to uh, be particularly of course, address um, the ones that are anticipated. Then the event happens and there's the response uh, aspect of it, and then there's the recovery period. And so in terms of um, the things we do, the, the part one and two uh, is part of our risk reduction uh, actions. And then uh, the resilience, um, of course, happens after there's a failure. Um, and uh, that's when it's tested and that's when it um, operates. There's an overlap between risk uh, reduction and resilience at the point of event. And um, the impact that any external event uh, can affect the system depends on its inherent adaptive capacity. And then afterwards, of course, the capacity to uh, uh, for that system to be able to bounce back. So that's uh, in terms of system resilience. If you think of a city um, and something happens like uh, what we know here in the Philippines, there are several things that are affected uh, in the end bottom line. There's a physical failure of bridges and buildings, for example. It has economic implications of, um, of uh, performance downgrade. There are social implications. Some people die, uh, lose their livelihood or their houses, and then environmental impacts. And so uh, my colleagues at the University of Melbourne uh, talk about recovery capitals after disasters. And they put a, a, an evidence-based resource and a guide on how to be able to plan and, um, and be more resilient and to recover uh, from disasters. This one you can see has seven bottom lines. And so that's part of the um, uh, bottom line approach, uh, both in sustainability, but also in resilience. And the uh, difficulty, of course, is that a lot of the systems are interdependent. And so then the NB, end bottom line impacts are hard to track. A failure in energy uh, system will, for example, affect uh, communications and mobility and, and so on. And they compound the problems and the impact on the economic, social, and environmental. Um, and so the physical um, uh, system failure uh, makes everything else worse. And then of course, uh, there's a cascading effect of uh, these asset failures, uh, which is now a major concern uh, across the world. 
an example of system interdependency that was mapped in the electrical system, electricity system in California. Uh, of course, you can uh, anticipate a lot of these things uh, in the first order effects when electric power goes down. And uh, the issue is that there are second, third, and fourth order effects that would affect other industries that most people don't realize, including oil production in the third order effects, banking and finance in the third order effects. So and again, true or false, when a city or state has sound resilience capability and adaptive capacity against typhoons, they will also be resilient against other natural hazards. True or false? What do you think? Well, it depends on the event. It's particular, your resilience is uh, dependent on the event. In this map, um, in this diagram, I show on the x-axis the time available to prepare, the warning available, and on the y-axis, the duration of the disruptive event. And so you can see, for example, that um, uh, if I map over here, there's a slow acting chronic stress in cities, uh, which is similar in a way to uh, sea level rise because you, you can see this uh, go on a bit-by-bit -bit basis over time. Uh, you have little warning for earthquakes and terrorist attacks. For example, you have a, a one or three or four hour warning for a tsunami and so on. And because they're weather related, sometimes they can be um, anticipated or uh, at least you have some warning. And the pandemic obviously uh, has little warning and lasts a long time. So these are there are typologies of this, including a cyber attack, mind you, there's usually no warning. And so you can map different types of extreme events in this typological classification. And the duration and the temporal intensity of this, uh, of an extreme event, is very important and defines how the system will respond and, and the extent of impact. The difficulty, of course, is that there are different levels of uncertainty uh, uh, about these events. We don't know what they are in some cases, their intensity, and when they will happen. So we have uh, a world of extremes and we have a world of uncertainties. Uh, for those in risk science and management, you'll be familiar with uh, this. Uh, there are three types of uncertainties. Um, there's epistemic uncertainties, which refer to the limitations of our knowledge and understanding of, uh, of reality, but also of our surroundings and the world. And um, the second part is the aleatory uncertainties, uh, which exist due to the inherent randomness or variability in the world around us. These uncertainties arise from the fundamental nature of many systems and phenomena. And the way we uh, deal with the auditory uncertainties is we collect a lot more data to be able to capture the, the probabilistic um, characteristics, in this case, uh, usually sometimes in terms of probability distributions of these uh, variables. Um, uh, and um, where in epistemic uncertainties, uh, we try to uh, gain better knowledge uh, through research, through experimentation, through modeling, uh, so that we can learn more about the phenomena. In aleatory, we deal with them by getting more and better data. Uh, there's a third type that I will um, uh, talk a little bit later, which is decision-making uncertainties, which is a combination of epistemic and aleatory, uh, but it's really the one where uh, humans now make a decision on the basis of the information that they have or don't have. It's the hazy fog surrounding a decision, uh, which is now also very, very important to be explicitly um, uh, recognized, understood, and taken into account. There are, there's a typology of extreme events that you may have heard some of these terminologies in the past. Uh, perfect storms is the one that is most commonly uh, understood, which means that these little things that you know very well about, and they just so happen to align at one point in one place, and it became a bigger event than it should be because of this alignment. Uh, we call that a perfect storm on one hand. And then there's this uh, dragon kings and gray rhinos. In gray rhinos, uh, this is about events that we know and have seen all the time, but we sort of uh, like uh, ignore them because they didn't make any uh, big impact in the past. And then suddenly they did. And so uh, you're, then you're surprised uh, because it did. Dragon kings are statistical extremes. It's a similar concept with gray rhinos, but these are the ones that go beyond um, like the, the typhoon Yolanda. Uh, we know typhoons in the Philippines uh, were the most frequently visited um, place uh, by typhoons, but then every now and then you have this statistical extreme. Uh, so Yolanda is a dragon king. 
And then there are the black swans, which are the highly improbable events that uh, most of you have heard. Some people think that many examples, what people call black swans, are actually gray swans. Uh, when they call it gray swan, it's closer to the concept of like gray rhino. Uh, so it's like a similar concept. The point of understanding this, the typology of extreme events is because the risk management approaches to these different types of extremities uh, require different um, uh, risk management approaches in slightly different ways and uh, priorities and, um, and focus. So that's the reason why we need to understand uh, these typologies. Of course, uh, we have historical hazards, cyclones or typhoons in the Philippines, as it is, uh, for example, in Australia. And then we have this evolving hazard uh, due to climate change. And you can see these, the changes in different, um, in carbon dioxide, ocean warming, sea level, temperature. Uh, historically, as far as we have data until 1930s and then more and more. And, uh, and the things that we started uh, uh, measuring a lot, and you can see all these uh, things that are evolving uh, up to the present and of course continues to the future. And so we map, for example, the bushfire or wildfire hazard with a thousand year return period in Australia. And the current mapping is on the left. And um, if we project it according to some of the scenarios, uh, future um, um, climate scenarios, it, by 2100, you can see the big difference in the nature of uh, wildfire, bushfire hazard in Australia. And so if you are building a road or a bridge, uh, a billion dollar investment, uh, for example, between South Australia and New South Wales, and, um, and uh, you build them according to a low level hazard, uh, you'd be in trouble in about 70 years. Uh, and this is true in extreme wind hazard, uh, same in the Philippines uh, that has a lot of extreme wind, that if you don't map the future and the things you build now will not be um, uh, good enough in 10, 20, 50 years um, in terms of performance. I've talked about the difficulty of concurrent hazards in that we're now, we don't now just uh, plan for one or two. In Australia, for example, uh, we had multiple periods in the last several years where uh, the different hazards are happening at exactly the same time. And we know this during the pandemic when, uh, when droughts, fires, cyclones, hailstorms happened over the pandemic, for example. So let's me move to uh, the concept of performance approach. How do you deal with this? Because I've told you a lot of problems and it may be depressing for some people. And but the idea is, okay, what can we do and how do we learn and address these issues? So uh, I was asked to um, contribute to uh, 250 words about the opportunities and barriers to net zero cities a couple of years ago. And I have to sum everything that I know into these 250 words uh, limit. And sometimes that's a very good exercise. Um, so I put in about uh, 10 or 20 ideas, 250 words. And of course, one of them would be that we need to approach um, net zero emission cities um, with a whole system, whole life approach, which I've been talking about. Um, and uh, we need to use a performance approach outcomes based in um, in the planetary boundary sense in terms not just of performance targets but budgets uh, like planetary boundary budgets like carbon budget or or the like um, context is very important the solutions got to work in your context um, we need to advance on all fronts top down and bottom up approaches deal with supply and demand involve everyone uh, whole society approach and uh, make sure to address social justice and equity. Uh, we need a sustained innovation and be complex adaptive. Um, and of course we use technology uh, to be able to drive in things, um, especially things to, to deal with uncertainties as I will discuss a little bit later on. And so we scale uh, this concept scales from uh, dealing with individual elements of the system to a bigger, um, bigger goals and bigger systems. Uh, the foundation of this is written um, like 25 years ago. Um, I think I published the left one in 2000 and then the second one on the right uh, four years later and they're available in the web. In simple concept, the performance approach means that we focus on the, the statement, the description of the outcome desire, the end rather than the solution. So that's the focus of the description of 
specification and therefore also the focus of assessment. Uh, when we are trying to figure out whether a solution meets that outcome, um, will achieve that outcome, we focus on assessing uh, that. And uh, the way uh, we operationalize this and the way we do it in research and the way I teach it in my classes is that um, you uh, split the end bottom line criteria at the top. And in this case, it's, it's, it's uh, laid out horizontally as my, what I call level one. Um, and of course, uh, in reality, the real world is complex, uh, uh, but we simplify the concept uh, to be able to do this in, in this sense that we have uh, parameters uh, of uh, these different um, categories uh, as an idealization. Sustainability science is um, a difficult uh, concept and um, I like best the definition proposed by uh, Bill Clark uh, uh, of Harvard University, now retired, when he wrote an editor, uh, he was an associate editor of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science then and wrote this, um, sustainability science research is seeking to support the integrative task of managing particular places where multiple efforts to meet multiple human needs interact with multiple life support systems in highly complex and often unexpected ways. So you almost give up uh, if it's this difficult, right? Uh, but this is the, the purpose, the goal of our seeking knowledge and understanding so that we can do something about it. Uh, the point is that it's focusing on this ma managing particular places. And so when we focus on uh, the city centers, the intense uh, activity that cause and drive um, resource use and consumption, it's the same uh, definition I almost would say use in defining urban science research. So I can interchange in a way the word sustainability and urban science and the definition and description is still correct. Uh, in fact, this is what I used to say, urban science is seeking to support integrative task of managing urban places. Um, and so it's the same concept that really uh, they're too complex. That's the reason why we simplify them uh, in this way in terms of operationalizing them and making decisions. The key of course is that we need a lot of data to be able to do the assessment at these levels, at the lower levels, at the elements uh, under each of these uh, headings. Um, so once you have data and you do this assessment, question, we can always determine the best sustainable solution options in a given problem objectively, true or false? Well, uh, when you deal at the lower level of individual um, assessment of performance, uh, and indicators, you need to weigh them and aggregate them. And so there's a multiple series of these to come out with an aggregation that puts you to the level of technical performance, environmental performance, and so on. And even once you get there, you have to weigh them at the end bottom line uh, level, right? And, and so uh, here comes your coffee problem. Uh, you like sugar a week or no sugar, uh, milk or no milk. And so then subjective decisions come in. So you can never actually have this objectivity, especially when we talk about human decisions. And so um, the broader you get into society, this objectivity and values play a lot more um, uh, prominence. And uh, when we do resilience, uh, it's the same framework. So I did tell you that it's almost like uh, different sides of a coin uh, where the smaller side on the resilience then we need to choose, I use the same framework when I teach this, um, this uh, approach of end bottom line uh, sustainability and resilience assessment. And I choose the performance that are critical uh, so that uh, at least minimum level of performance is uh, served by any system, whether it's the water system, the road system, communication system. And then you design them accordingly using the same framework in the sustainability resilience framework. And the target then is avoid or minimize this functional failure. Um, and in terms of uh, design uh, and dealing with resilience, there are layers of resilience that I um, uh, recommend. The first one is what I call the engineering or design resilience uh, so that um, you anticipate that if an event greater than the design event 
happens, uh, you build in the design in the design. Uh, the example of this is the the base isolation systems and buildings against earthquakes. So they are not used for smaller earthquakes, but when the, there's a greater earthquake than normal, uh, then you use uh, the base isolation works uh, without human intervention. The idea with this engineering or design resilience is that the system gets back into shape um, and uh, perform its service without human intervention because it's been designed. When there's an event that's uh, stronger than the design period, um, it actually fails. So you need operational resilience, you need to plan. And it's usually at the level of the company that supplies the service, but it can be at the level of the consortium, like what happens in energy uh, failure. Uh, even if one company is responsible for deliver of electricity, uh, the rest of the electricity sector uh, comes into uh, work sometimes to help each other. Uh, and the whole sector uh, can do that to restore um, uh, service. And then uh, the next level, if it still fails, you involve the community, uh, the people that you serve. And again, the example of this is the use of, of uh, energy or electricity. And then in, um, in another layer is the societal resilience, uh, like what happened during the pandemic, that everyone now is involved um, in trying to uh, deal with the situation. So these layers of resilience can be um, uh, considered and be planned of the event. The problem, of course, as we said, is that now we have uh, problems of um, uh, uh, complexity, but also these concurrent hazards that while you're dealing with uh, an existing event, uh, other events come into play. And then these issues of, of operational and community resilience become even more difficult to track and address. And so uh, this concept, uh, we've um, I've developed this many years ago and I had a PhD student um, imp implement this in um, energy systems for uh, net zero communities uh, that he got a PhD for. Uh, and then I had, um, some uh, social scientist collaborators that look at community resilience and well-being and the importance of trust in the community to be able to um, for the community to be resilient and uh, the issue is that there's a propagation effect an event at the bottom can fail one system as i talk about infrastructure interdependencies and then it fails other things in the system it has a direct local impact and an indirect impact and a broader socioeconomic impacts. And the decision of all the stakeholders along that ecosystem can uh, make a big difference on how uh, that socioeconomic impact propagates the intensity, the duration of this. And so that's the reason why in some large events and longer events, uh, you need a whole society um, resilience effort. Um, and this concept is the basis for what used to be called consequence-based engineering and management in that the events that have a, a higher and larger socioeconomic impact will be prioritized in terms of strengthening uh, that asset. And the, so I can map the efforts in this case, uh, the efforts would be the what's the core of that uh, diagram in terms of their contribution uh, to the sustainable development goals, all 17 of them and the targets around them. And so you can evaluate uh, national policy and efforts and actions. And uh, in terms of, um, of um, urban form, um, you can see that uh, we can, the physical aspect of a city um, is something that we know quite well because that's what we live uh, and use. Uh, so built on the natural environment is the built environment. And of course, that's where the socioeconomic activities happen. Um, Churchill once said of buildings only, that humans shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Um, and this is true at the level of urban as well. We shape our cities and afterwards our cities shape us. Um, and so this urban form has a big influence in the outcome of our society, how we uh, configure our cities, as and you, most of you would know the issues we deal, for example, in Metro Manila and other similar cities. And uh, there are ways of uh, describing uh, urban form. One I use is what I call the urban DMA. Uh, this stands for density. There are many measures of density, uh, mix uh, measures of, uh, di of uh, diversity, land use and the social demographic and measures of access. Uh, so every city 
would have their own unique urban DMA, for example. And uh, that's the one that we normally can um, um, observe the change in urban form over time, uh, its state, space, and time, regardless of what's driving that change, whether it's policy or population, social demographic, uh, technology, or change in markets or environment. Uh, my question and my biggest um, interest is that whatever drives the change in urban form, what are their impacts on ecology and the environment, on economy and on social and, and societal quality of life, for example, which is livability. In, in, other, um, in other words, it's about the end bottom line impact, as I discussed before. So everything comes down to that. It's, and the idea of some of our work, a lot of my work is on modeling uh, this flow from drivers to change an urban form to impacts. And the more we know about this, then if we're targeting certain impact uh, outcomes, remember performance approach, uh, target outcomes on the impact categories, and therefore uh, we can drive the right policy or, or drive and develop the right technology, uh, direct uh, markets and so on and so forth to improve build form, to improve the outcome in the end bottom line. The modeling approaches can be top down or bottom up. As I said earlier, we need both uh, advance on all fronts. And there are a number of uh, examples I'm not going to talk about but, uh, much, but just to show you uh, the change in, um, in land use, for example, in Shaman by one of my former PhD students uh, and the uh, impact on um, ecological um, services. Uh, and then of course, the impact of urban form on the greenhouse emissions uh, footprint, carbon footprint uh, in Melbourne uh, that considers not just uh, carbon in the building, in the houses, but also in transport, mobility. And so if you have different planning, uh, this uh, criteria or a policy, uh, whether you build around activity centers, compact or corridor cities or sprawl, you will have this different um, greenhouse emission footprint of your city. And so there are a number of other um, papers that we do in terms of uh, carbon footprint of cities uh, in building stock. We also did um, uh, material products, water, energy, food, again, in the city of Melbourne, the total energy use, uh, the total um, uh, water use and, and waste and uh, from all industries. Um, and then you can map these things. And then we look at uh, quality of life. In this case, uh, the contribution of uh, third places in urban form in uh, the social interactions and quality of life of senior adults. We look at different measures of urban form, quantitative measures, and develop a model uh, um, of um, uh, what could initiate or, or sustain or enhance social interactions. Uh, cafes are very important, as you'd expect. I have a big project in Singapore on um, that use all the kinds of data, observe data, objective data, subjective data, on um, on the role of public parks or outdoor recreation spaces um, in um, the life of residents, urban residents. And so that's the idea. This is the concept of the, of the target. Now I should stop and say um, data is very important. Um, so I'll skip that and the use of digital twins uh, technology to be able to do this modeling. Um, and uh, the physical internet is the, uh, freight and logistics systems transformation and how you can reconfigure it uh, again to support this uh, triple and bottom line uh, outcomes in society, uh, for example, which we um, uh, lead in nationally with uh, other academics, but also industry and government here in the Philippines. Um, so uh, the last aspect is decision-making uncertainties that I mentioned earlier. And one of the most famous uh, concept here is the one by Snowden, uh, who I hosted at the University of Melbourne uh, at some point. And uh, his old uh, 2007 Harvard Business Review paper is one of the most uh, downloaded and read um, papers in HBR. And uh, it had a lot of repeated uh, issue of HBR during the pandemic uh, because of the difficulties in um, decision-making in that. I talk a lot about this framework and um, I think I'll... Uh, be very quick on this one, just to point you uh, to the website of Conovin. Uh, and uh, the, the, your decision depends on whether you are in obvious domain 
complicated, complex, or chaotic. Uh, most of the systems that happen in the real world is in the complex domain, especially under crisis or extreme events. Um, other things are complicated. There are a few things that are obvious. And then your action and decision depends on where you are in the system. In complex domain, the problem is that the interrelationship and interdependencies are not known uh, or clarified or understood that well. And so uh, the action there is uh, make little experiments, see what happens to the system, and then uh, be complex adaptive, uh, change uh, your actions. Um, uh, so the most important thing in complex environments is to have the feedback loops that are near real time or real time so that you can always adjust uh, your decisions. And super sensing um, uh, are very important in um, in cities in particular. So you need to be able to know where they are applicable and useful as opposed to where they're not. And um, so you use uh, sensors and you need um, automated sense making using analytics, but you, in the end you need human sense making using this framework, which is now used as a pattern in the USA in the Homeland Security Department. Uh, there is a manual for managing complexity and chaos in times of crisis in the EU on the right. And the Canada also promotes this in their government uh, executive learning programs. Um, and the last thing probably uh, to close is the importance of partnership and transdisciplinary collaboration. Most of you are familiar with the book, The Limits to Growth uh, from the Club of Rome. What uh, most people don't know about is the Club of Rome um, uh, procured this work from MIT uh, at that time, but it was funded by Volkswagen uh, Foundation. Uh, so this is a combination of different stakeholders coming together. Uh, and this is still what's required in SDG 17, partnership for SDGs. Uh, that I talked about in a blog I did in my LinkedIn um, uh, blog many years ago. And the idea is that from the concept of six degrees of separation, now that we are socially networked <laughs> to six degrees of collaboration. Um, and the idea is that if we are that close to each other, then if we decide we would like to save the world, <laughs> We, you and I can make a difference because we are only um, six uh, persons uh, separate from anyone else in the world today. So um, sustainability will be lost or won in our cities and urban sustainability and resilience are not optional aspirations. They are essential and critical and time is the ultimate non-renewable resource. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Greg, uh, for your insightful presentation of Urban Sustainability Framework and also uh, for discussing various uh, and uh, bottom line frameworks. Okay, so now that uh, we already have a good number of participants, uh, perhaps uh, we can move on to the question and answer. Uh, Ms. Ria? Thank you, Doc Aris. And Thank you, Professor Greg. I learned a lot today. So first, you introduced us to uh, sustain resilient paths to sustainability and then the triple bottom line. And beyond that, the one, the framework that you authored, the NBL, which is to me is very interesting and the importance of measuring and targeting. You also walked us through disaster management cycles the different approaches, the systems and performance approach, and also urban science and the layers of resilience. So I learned really today, you walked us through your research. Thank you so much. Um, so if the audience has any questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand so we can unmute you or you can type your questions in the chat box. Maybe I'll ask the first question. Uh, my my question is, can the framework be a, applied at different scales, um, meaning, for example, at community scale or at the city or province scale? Uh, is it still applicable at when we talk about uh, the different scales? Yes, that's the short answer. That's why I talk about the scale, right? Uh, so mm. it can be at the material level, mm. at the very smallest level uh, to the planet. Yeah, because essentially the planetary boundary thresholds, uh, that's a that's a performance target or a, a level. Yeah, and so it's the same. It scales everywhere. In fact, when I teach it to my uh, master students uh, at the University of Melbourne, and we interviewed them once, and on, one of them said, um, um, 
I can apply it in my personal life and many other decisions I make on a day by day basis. Mm, even in a <laughs> so, even in a personal scale. <laughs> yes, and so um, in fact, one of my exercises, uh, first exercises before I teach them the detail, is uh, buying a car. <laughs> so use the end bottom line in buying a car, <laughs> and so they that's their first homework, and so they use an end bottom line criteria. Thank you, Prof Professor Greg. All right. Uh, maybe we can talk about the Philippines. Any practical applications that can be easily applied in the Philippine scenario uh, when, when we try to construct our cities? You're asking me. So as I said, like you can use it for anything. Um, mm. So uh, building your own house or uh, renovating your own house, buying a, a new house, um, buying your car. Um, and of course, uh, <laughs> the, the biggest question of um, urban transport. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I don't think I need to um, uh, expand on that. Uh, you know what the problem is and you can apply this certainly. This is the project that uh, we do then on a semestral or a capstone project for our masters is that then uh, I get them to... Um, to choose a problem and where they can apply it. First principles: there are there are uh, the sustainability assessment systems that are out, out there um, are sim highly simplified version of this. But then uh, I teach uh, first principles so that you can build almost from scratch uh, even your assessment framework. But it takes a while and understanding. But the idea is to understand the concept. And even if you use uh, pre-made uh, frameworks, you all would understand that you can add to it and you can go deeper than normal. Hey, we have another question from the audience. Have you done modeling using the NBL approach to include politics in the context of Philippine politics as an additional bottom, bottom line? I suppose this will be part of the social bottom line or may this be taken separately? <laughs> yeah, that was um, that's very important. It's in the governance aspect, and that's why I talk about uh, decision making as part of the uncertainty. So, in the past, uh, for most of us model modelers um, who've done a lot of modeling, we take into account uncertainties by just using this uh, probabilistic uh, representation of of important variables, right? Um, and um, when well, we've done it for a long time, and then we recognize the different impacts of um, of uh, key players uh, in a system. And these are usually the decision makers and they have the, the, the strongest impact and they, are, um, they change their mind quickly. And who are they? They are the people, <laughs> the people who make decisions. So it's not just the politicians, but it's us and everyone else in between. We change our minds. And, and that's the reason why I think agent-based modeling for modelers, I talk in modeling language, uh, becomes important because you can take into account uh, these behavioral considerations at different levels of granularity uh, in your models. Um, usually, uh, we simplify them a lot. And so it's a matter of what you think are most important. You take them into greater detail in modeling and the others in simplified form, right? Depending on the purpose of modeling. So if you'd like to take into account the behavior of policymakers, let me just uh, put them in that category, right? Policymakers, um, uh, put both politicians and bureaucrats, technocrats in government that set the environment by which we uh, operate. Uh, then um, you can uh, you can model them explicitly or uh, as external settings in your in your system models. Thank you, Professor Greg. In relation to modeling, and uh, the question, uh, there's a question raised uh, by Professor Aviso. How do you deal with conflicting goals of the stakeholders? Yes, um, I don't deal with them. I try to capture them. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and that's the reason why. Um, I don't recommend uh, the single index, meaning at the level, at the bottom line. So this is what we do in multi-criteria analysis, right? So we put them in the same kind of unit, <laughs> so that you can have one final unit, right? And then you, and then you choose your so-called best decision at that level, and we do that in modeling. And so um, in most of the uh, sustainability assessment indices, uh, it, they do the same thing because they want one number. And then the range of numbers become uh, bronze, silver, platinum, or gold, or something like that, right? Or uh, they can be whatever other metaphor they use, um, this single index. Um, 
okay, there's use for that. But I, I wanted to say, stay at the second level before before that, where I have the end bottom line, because then um, your decision becomes transparent. Because if you tell me your decision, I can uh, you can almost trace what they value. <laughs> The subjective nature of the decision becomes apparent that the reason they chose uh, option B is because it's the best economically or the best there. So transparency, because there's always a trade-off. And in the trade-off, their subjective value show. Hey, thank you, Professor Greg. We also do that. Uh, we analyze the trade-offs between conflicting goals in our research. So in relate uh related to our research, um correct me if I wrong if I'm wrong, but uh I think resiliency is quite synonymous to adaptation. And in the Philippines, uh in with regards to climate change, we focus on adaptation rather than mitigation. So my question to you is uh where does mitigation enter the picture in the framework? I'm guessing that in your um in your model uh, bouncing back stronger i would assume that the stronger part would include the mitigation but can you elaborate more always on... uh, okay. remember the concept advance on all fronts uh, it's mm -hmm. not either or um, mm -hmm. all solutions need to be both um, mitigating climate and adapted to climate impacts yeah um you cannot we cannot afford uh that's why I say sustainability and resilience. Mitigation, in, in, in terms of the climate speak, it's both mitigation and adaptation, not or. Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, if you're only doing mitigation and not adaptation, uh, these socioeconomic impacts become real. Uh, and as you know, uh, the impacts are asymmetric. Uh, the people who are least responsible, uh, the poor people, for example, are the ones that are affected most. Uh, right uh, by these things uh, so social justice issue but uh, that's in the mitigation space in the adaptation space you can have be maladapted meaning that you are adapting uh, to the situation but you are increasing mitigation in your solution uh, sorry you're increasing greenhouse emissions in your solution then that's maladaptation mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you may be addressing your short term but you're making things worse in the medium and long term so you're in an ever cycle of adapting because you're never able to uh, get out of it because you're not mitigating and so mm -hmm. the ideal approach is you're always doing both not either or uh, mm -hmm. your solution now and so this concept then that's the reason why I put them in the same framework uh, so that in the sustainability and resilience assessment framework it's the same framework it's already built in thank you professor I agree with you to that we should take these two uh, concepts mitigation and adaptation equally and not prioritize one thing over the other so in the Philippine case uh, that's the problem. Uh, we focus on the adaptation side and then the mitigation is just a co-benefit of the adaptation side. We have, um, we can entertain one last question from the audience. I, does anyone have any question? So if none, we can, can I, can we ask you for a takeaway, take home message? for the audience or key takeaway? So I think that's what I said, that uh, sustainability and resilience considerations in, in climate speak, uh, like we just discussed, climate mitigation and adaptation are not optional actions. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, if we don't change and don't address them explicitly, uh, then it's just a matter of time uh, that, uh, things collapse because we reach planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then this um, this cascade of failure uh, that lead to societal uh, decline and, and failure. So uh, in this case, time is the ultimate non-renewable resource. What we don't do today is lost mm -hmm. already. What did we didn't do yesterday? So time is the ultimate non-renewable resource. So we advance on climate mitigation, climate adaptation, system of the resilience today. Wow. Thank you so much, Professor Greg Fuliente. Before we end, we would like to invite everyone to answer the feedback form. Uh, this is so that we can know how to improve our delivery of the 
monthly sustainability series. And then, of course, uh, bef before we finally end this uh, meeting, we would like to invite you to next month's lecture, uh, which is on climate smart agriculture information sources and dissemination pathways used by smallholder farmers in the province of Batangas. It will be delivered by Professor Annalisa Resurrection uh, of the Communication and Media Studies at De La Salle Lipa. Philippines. All right. So once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we went a bit over time, but I think it's worth it, right? And um, thank you so much to our wonderful speaker. Again, we learned a lot, um, something that uh, we can all ponder about through the rest of our day and the rest of the week. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I hope that you would have a great week rest of the week ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor thank you. Greg. Well done. See you next month. Thank you, uh, thank you Ria. Thank you, Professor Kalaba. Thank you, um, Aris, Raymond, and Kate. Thank you. Thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you.